Good evening, everyone. <clears throat> Welcome to our final night of our Daniel and Revelation seminar. How many of us are sad that the seminar is ending? <laughs> okay, all of us. Okay. Well, uh, hopefully this won't be the last time here to present messages about Daniel and Revelation. Hopefully one day in the future we can come back and share even more what God has uh, blessed us with. And so before we begin, um, why don't we start off with a word of prayer and then we're going to go into our panel discussion questions for this evening. So with that, I'm going to ask Brother Rents to lead us in a short word of prayer. Let us pray. Gracious, loving Father, we thank you, Lord, for revealing wonderful messages that are from your Bible, Lord, and allowing us to receive the blessing of these messages, Lord. Tonight, Lord, as we go to our um, special segment, I guess is one way to put it, Lord, we pray that this would allow us to clear up any confusion, any questions, but most importantly, Lord, may it be you who will clear up all these questions, Lord. May it be you who will answer, Lord, that um, we are just your instruments in sharing the word and sharing the gospel. And we pray, Lord, that you would guide our hearts, guide our lips in whatever we say. And in the same manner, Lord, I pray that you would send your Holy Spirit to all of us here to be able to comprehend everything that we will talk about tonight. Um, protect us with your holy angels from the attacks of the enemy, Lord. And most of all, may this give glory unto your name. This is our prayer. Amen. So before we begin um, our panel discussion, we're going to begin with a short introduction of ourselves, of the panel, the panel wees. <laughs> so uh, we're going to start off um, uh, with Mike and then uh, I'll, I'll, I'll end last. Basically, just tell us a little something, uh, your name and your college and what are you doing and uh, how God has blessed you as well. Hello, my name is uh, Mike Magdadaro. I'm from the island of Oahu, Hawaii, from the United States. Uh, my college is a uh, college of theology, um, first year, going into second year. Um, what I can say is that God has been truly blessing me over my time um, that I gave my life to him, and even during uh, presenting topics such as Daniel and Revelation to you guys. And yeah, I'd like to just give God the all the glory, honor, and praise. And, you know, thank you guys so much. Thank you girls so much for attending every night and uh, praying for us. Amen. Hello, everyone. <laughs> My name is Liam Sampson. Actually, I'm not in COT, but I'm a CON student, uh, fourth year. Um, I've been, actually been blessed with this uh, Dan and Rev series, and I wanted to join my brothers up here in um, the panel discussion to be able to um, be a part of the blessing, so. Good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is Renz Daniel Espelita. I was born here in the Philippines, but when I was 12 years old, my family migrated to Canada. And in 2016, I decided to come back and pursue theology. The reason I pursued theology was I wanted to be a chaplain in an Adventist school. And so one of the requirements was to have a religious study background. Um, and by God's grace, I am here and I'm able to serve my fellow sisters in Christ and brothers as well. And last but not least, my name is Mark Prashan. I'm from the same island as Mike, Oahu, from Hawaii. And uh, I am a fourth year uh, theology student here at AUP. Um, and God is so good, amen? Um, during these past several weeks, it's been a huge blessing um, for me personally and, and also for all of us to share the messages of Daniel and Revelation to each and every one of you. So I hope that each and every one of us um, was blessed. And uh, we'll be blessed as well tonight. And so um, we're going to begin now our questions. And I'm going to just share like the format of it. There was basically uh, a total of 18 questions that was uh, given to us um, in total. Um, as well as four other um, uh, can you comment about this topic 
uh, type of questions as well. And so, so we have a lot to cover. We have about 22 things to discover, so much things um, to get done. And so we're, we're, we're basically just going to go right, right in it. And we're going to start off with the first question. And um, if uh, every, for every uh, three questions, after the third question is given, um, we'll pause and we'll entertain maybe one question that you guys may have as well, um, that you guys may have on the spot. And so if you have any other questions that's not originally on this slide, um, please feel free to raise your hand. And we have mics here. You can give us your questions. And by God's grace, we can try to answer them. All right, so let's start off with the first three questions. And yes? Can I also say, um, if the question that you have on the third question is one of the questions that will be on the presentation, then we'll let you know, and then we'll go along the, the order. So that way we can, st we can stay organized and we don't get lost from one way or another. All right, so our first question, here is our first question. This is actually a two-part question. Uh, question number one, will the weak and feeble people f whom God makes them fall asleep before the probation, uh, sorry, before the proclamation of the National Sunday Law be in heaven? That's question number one. Question two, and will they be counted as the saint or the saints who will resurrect on the second coming of Christ? So this is actually a good question, and I'm going to turn this over to uh, Brother Renz. So, to answer this question, I'd like to share this verse found in Psalms 116, verse 15. It says, precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of his saints. Now, when we read this verse, is it saying that God is happy when we die? Is he having, is, it, is he saying that this, this image of his children dying, is it precious to him? Well, the death itself is not, but the death as a saint is. So being or dying as one of his saints, that is what is precious to the Lord. Well, let's, let's look further. further. Um, saints are not sinless people, even though they hate sin. So you and I could be saints. You know, we're not sinless people. But what does a saint do? They are totally dedicated to the Lord, therefore godly or pious. Pious is just a, is a term for strongly, religiously faithful. Um, in God's eyes, such a death is precious because these believers are dying with faith in God. So God is happy or God is, is he is enjoying the fact that when his saints pass away, they pass away having the faith in him. Now, what does that mean for us? Or perhaps for people who already passed away. Let's look at Matthew chapter 5, verse 10. It says, blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake. Or for, um, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Now, it doesn't only mean persecution, where someone will die um, because of their faith. But what's important is they die having righteousness in their hearts. And when that happens, the kingdom of heaven or the place that God is preparing for us is something for them. Also, um, so the, the second question, are they counted as the saints who will resurrect in the second coming? <clears throat> Let's look in 1 Corinthians 15, verses 50 to 55. These are part of these verses. Let's look at the first verse. It says, now this I say, brethren, that flesh and blood, when you have flesh and when you have blood in the flesh, it means that you're alive. They cannot inherit the kingdom of God, nor does corruption or being dead, someone who, like a flesh and blood that's already corrupted is already a term for dying, inherit in corruption. What does this mean? Well, in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet, which signifying the second coming of Jesus, um, the trumpet will sound and the dead will be raised incorruptible and we shall be, sh be changed. The, the verse explains what this means. It says that when this corruptible has put on incorruption and this mortal has put on immor immortality, 
then shall be brought to the past, saying that the, the pa um, to pass the saying that is written, death is swallowed up in victory. So basically, um, before we go there, when we are flesh and blood, we are flesh and blood, and knowing in the history, we came from our very greatest grandfather, Adam and Eve, our grandparents, Adam and Eve. They are now sinful, right? And because of their sinfulness, this has been passed on to all of us. When we die, we, that, in, that corruption stays within us. But when we have the faith in Jesus Christ, when we are resurrected, we are then transformed from corruption to incorruption. And how can we be resurrected? Well, Jesus says, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me, though he may die, so this is where the question, will they be resurrected and be in heaven? Though he may die, he shall live. And whoever lives and believes in me shall never die. So these are the two parallels that we, we talked about. The first one is flesh and blood. So if he believes in Jesus Christ and Jesus Christ returns, he will never die. Although if they do die before Jesus Christ comes, he shall live again. Does that make sense? All right, so I think that answers the first question. Oh, going on. Now it is important, so Jesus asked the Samaritan, um, not the Samaritan woman, but he asked the person, he says, do you believe this? And she replies, yes, Lord. I believe that you are the Christ, the Son of God, who is to come into the world. So it's one thing to know the fact. It's another thing to believe it. And Jesus Christ says, you can have this promise of either not dying and surviving until Jesus Christ returns, or if ever you do die, you will, you will live again if and when you believe that I am Christ. That is Jesus Christ's call for all of us. So, does anyone from our panel would like to add on to that? Yeah, good. Okay. Question number three. Of all numbers, why the 144,000? Well, this is actually uh, Ren's, uh, Ren's slide, so he's going to share again. <laughs> <laughs> all right. So, let's take a look at this. In the Bible, 12 is a very significant number. If we look in the Old Testament, we have the 12 tribes of Israel. There's Reuben, Simeon, Levi, Dan, Judah, Naphtali, Issachar, Gad, Asher, Joseph, Zebulun, and Benjamin. In the New Testament, there's the 12 disciples. So in the Old Testament, God, through Abraham, chose his nation, his people. In the New Testament, Jesus chose his people who will share the gospel into the world. So... When we look at the number 12, it's signifying the chosen people of God. Are we clear so far? So if we put that idea together, or that, that knowledge, the 12 is a symbol of God's chosen people. In the Old Testament, it was the 12 tribes. In the New Testament, it was the disciples. 144,000 is the representation of the inclusion, meaning to say from the Old Testament and from the New Testament. If we have 12 times 12, equals to 144. Now, the 1,000 is a symbol of, of a, a great multitude, a great number. For example, if we look in, um, this is more of a, uh, a simple analogy. If we look in the world today, most of bills, the biggest number, for example, in the Philippines, 1,000, right? And it's a symbolism of many or most or a great multitude. Um, or a great amount of people, rather. So 144, so 12 times 12 times 1,000 is a representation of inclusion of everyone from the past, throughout history, up until today, of all the believers of the Messiah, both from the Old and the New Testament. Anyone would like to add on our panel? Yes, okay. Yeah. Uh, what I was also told about the 144 and doing my own research as well, um, if you see a number in the Bible, uh, specifically um, the 144, you can look back in the book of Numbers 
And chapter 2 talks about um, tribes and the, the armies. And specifically, they are called to battle. So the 144 is um, like what Ren said, is an inclusion of the Old and New Testament. But most importantly, they are a specific group that are called to battle for Christ. Amen. Um, to add to this as well, um, when you think of the 144,000, the biggest question that you have is, is it literal or is it symbolic? And we kind of earlier, we kind of already made the reasoning that if the number was, if it was uh, literal, then that means that uh, only Israel would be saved, right? If it was literal 144,000 people, then that means uh, only, only the 144,000 are virgins, which means if you are not a virgin, then too bad. You know, you can't be a part of that number. So we kind of made this, uh, uh, we were reasoning out and we were just asking questions. If it was literal, then are they really virgins? But we understand now that to be a, a virgin doesn't mean to be a physical virgin in, in, in Revelation chapter 14. What it means is to be a spiritual virgin, not, being, uh, have, not having relationship with other denominations or to other churches having that, that truth that they preach influence our own lives. Um, later on, we're gonna see about, we're gonna talk more about the wine of Babylon, and we're gonna see how the wine of Babylon actually means the false doctrines of Babylon that it gives to its uh, other churches as well. And so with that, anyone else like to share? Good, okay. So since we finished the three questions, um, before we move on to our fourth question, we're going to pause right now and entertain any one of your guys' questions. And so please, if you have a questions, start thinking ahead so that every third question, you guys can just raise up one hand and then we'll send you the mic uh, as well. So who has a question from the audience that they would like to ask? Is there any hands, any, any questions about Daniel Revelation so far? Don't be afraid. Don't be afraid. I'm Says. The one who's afraid. <laughs> no hands? Okay, how about this? How about we'll, we, we'll save it until the sixth question. Is that okay? We'll answer two, we'll answer two if you guys have by the sixth, the sixth question. Okay, so let's, let's move on. So let's look at question number four. Does, what does 666 mean as one of the characteristics of the mark of the beast? And what made you say that it represents papal Rome? So with that, I'm going to give this also to Renz because he is the one that had talked about this slide as well. Um, okay, so what does 666, uh, 666 really mean? So I guess looking back to when I presented the message, I understand why this question is being asked um, now. So it's just a repeat of the question. Before we can ask or answer this question, we must first look at the counterpart or the, the, um, the perfection, the, the, the right one, and because Mark the Beast, we know, is the counterfeit, right? So we know that the God seal, just a very quick review, is it has three important things, the name, the title, and the territory. So God is our, the sealer, and he is our creator, the, his, that's his authority to seal us, and his territory, heaven, and earth. Now let's look at a comparison. So first, the seal of God. Deuteronomy 6, verse 6 to 8, uh, Moses repeats the Ten Commandments to the people. And right after repeating the Ten Commandments to the people, he says this verse. He says, and these words which I will, I command, or this is the Lord God saying rather, and these words which I command you today shall be in your heart. You shall bind them as a sign on your hand and they shall be as frontlets between your eyes. Let's look at the comparison 
in Mark of the Beast. In Revelations 13, verse 16, it says, He causes all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and slave, to receive a mark on their right hand or on their foreheads, right? Now, before we go on, do you remember the six identifying um, characteristics of the beast? The first one was it got authority from pagan Rome. The second one is that it was a worldwide religious organization. The third one was it was a, it equated itself with God. Number four, um, what was number four again? Number five is they reigned for 1,260 or 1,260 years. Um, oh, they persecuted the saints. So they had a persecuting power, right? And those five characteristics can actually be found from the, the sea beast. So if we go back to the question, what makes you say that this is papal Rome? So the, 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 question, the, um, the answer to that is actually there's two beasts. Well, there's three if you include the dragon. But in Revelation 13, there's two beasts, right? The first beast did not have 666. However, the second beast, the earth beast, did have the 666. Uh, if you go to Revelation 13, verse 18, if I'm not mistaken, that verse or the, the number 666 is representing the earth beast. Now, is this literal or is this, um, what's the word, symbolic? Now, if we go back to here, to this idea, is God's seal upon us literal or symbolic? Is God's seal, the commandments, is it on our hands or is it on our, between our eyes? It's not literally there, right? But rather it's a symbol of being on our hand rather, that's not good. <laughs> Thank you, Liam. Um, being on our hand, meaning to say, in all of our actions, in everything that we do, it reflects the, the law. And being in the, the frontlet, a frontlet is, if you look at the church, in front of the church, it's like the, the thing that you put in front of the, uh, of the stage, kind of like a decoration, you know? So a frontlet is something that people see in our um, when they look at us, in our character. So, so this is, in, in comparison to Mark of the Beast, the, when he put the mark on the hand, it's a coercion or a forceful thing, or putting on the forehead means it is uh, a deceiving. Now, if we go on, it says that, so this is just a comparison. God puts the sign on your hand, so it is a signal to the people that your action shows you have the commandments and a frontlet, which is also kind of like a decoration. When people look at you, they notice right away that God's character is in you. Now, the mark of the beast, it is, we are, are the people who have it are forced to do it, or they are deceived by it. Um, and I think number five also, similar question. But I hope that answers the question. Amen, thank you. Anyone else like to share? If not, we'll move on, okay. Number five, question. Can you please elaborate on the meaning of Babylon as confusion? What is the significance in our present day today? And so this is a good question, and I'm, um, I'm, Renz and I are actually going to answer it as well as if you guys want to answer it as well. I'm going to start off with a verse. Well, here's the simple answer, basically. Babel, the root word for Babylon, is first mentioned in Genesis 11 and verse 9, when God confused their language for making the Tower of Babel. And Babel simply just means, what everyone? Confusion. Now, when you go to Genesis 11 and verse 9, it says here, this is the first time it's mentioned in Scripture in Genesis. It says, therefore, its name is called Babel, Babel, because there the Lord confused the language of all the earth and from and from there, the Lord scattered them abroad over the face of the earth. And so what we need to understand is how does Babel or Babylon, how does it, um, how does it equate to confusion? Because the word Babylon just simply means confusion. 
But I want to show you one more, one more scripture verse found in Psalm chapter 60, verse 3. Notice what it says. You have shown your people hard things. You have made us drink the wine of what, everyone? Confusion. So wine is a symbol of confusion. Babylon is a symbol or simply represents confusion. Now, we need to ask our, the question is, how does that apply to us today? Why is this so important today, especially in the last days? Well, we're going to look in the last days. In Revelation 13, there is a power. The, the, there's two beasts in Revelation 13. The first beast is, comes from the sea, which represents papal Rome. And we're going to see what this, what this looks like. How is papal Rome have the wine of confusion, the wine of Babylon? Notice what it says in Revelation 17. Come, I will show you the judgment of the great harlot who sits on many waters with whom the kings of the earth committed fornication and the inhabitants of the earth were made drunk with the wine of her, what everyone? Her fornication. Now, what happened? Well, the next verse. The woman was arrayed in purple and scarlet and adorned with gold and precious stones and pearls, having in her hand a, what everyone? A golden cup full of abominations and the filthiness of her fornication. Now, look, look the next verse, verse 5. And on her forehead was a name written, mystery, what everyone? Babylon. Babylon just simply means confusion, the great, the mother of harlots. We don't have the time to go into it, but basically Babylon has other churches that follow and worship this mother church, Babylon, the uh, church of Rome and of the abominations of the earth. The last verse. And I saw the woman drunk with the what, everyone? The blood of the saints and with the blood of the martyrs of Jesus. And when I saw her, I marveled with great amazement. So you guys see the correlation of wine and confusion and Babel and Babylon and the wine of Babylon. The wine of Babylon confuses people about God's truth. It gives a counterfeit truth, which leads to the blood of God's saints and the blood of the martyrs of Jesus. And this is what she was drinking. This is symbolic, of course, not literal. Now, Renz is going to explain the historical side to this. So when we first read the verse where the first account of Babel came from, God confused the world and kind of, so the question comes up, why would God confuse his people? Or why would God not want his people to be able to speak with one another? Well, let's look at the story. It begins with, the whole earth had one language and one speech, meaning there was no Tagalog, there was no Visayans, there was no, there was no different dialects, there was just one language and there was one speech, okay? And they said, the people, they were creating, they, they discovered how to make bricks and they discovered how to put it on top of each other and they said, let us build ourselves a city and a tower whose top is in the heavens. Let us make a name for ourselves because the previous story before this is the story of the flood. So people... They, they knew that God is a God of power and that he has the ability to destroy the earth. And so they wanted to face against God and say, you cannot destroy us again. Therefore, we will create a tower that will be our protection against you, lest we be scattered aboard, abroad over the face of the whole earth. Um, so the Lord came down. Now, notice it says came down. When God comes down, it is oftentimes or all the time it is associated with doing something very important. Um, just like example, Lord came down when Jesus was baptized and he showed himself to the people and he spoke. Another example is he came down to give the commandments to the people. So coming down meaning to say this act or this story is very important. Why? The Lord said indeed the people are one and they all have one language and this is what they begin to do. Now, nothing that they purpose to do will be withheld from them. If all of us were in one accord, 
we can do anything and everything we want. That is how great we are. The, the psalmist says, how great are you? How mindful are you that you created us a little lower than angels? We have, we have great potential. And if we are able to use it, we can do many great things. That's where we, we learn the story um, that God confused them. And the reason why God confused them is... So after the flood, people were afraid and they wanted to go against God and they wanted to rebel against God. Notice in, in the old language, the name Babylon means Babylon, or it translates to Babylon, which is a gate of the gods. So they understood that them as a people, they had, like, through them as a nation, they could do the same things that God can do. They realized that they are like the gateway of God's work. So God can use them to do great things. But it is very interesting that from the same similar, uh, a sister word, I guess is one way we put it, is the word Balal, or in English, Babel, which is Confucian. Now, the reason why God confused the people is because we as humans, we have the ability to do great things, but our nature is towards evil. Therefore, if this power and ability is used for evil, God will work to prevent it from succeeding. On the other hand, if it is used in good, God will multiply our work tenfold. So if we look in the story of Babylon, the reason why it is a confusing um, to add on to what Mark um, already said, the reason, another reason why it's a confusing nation is because it looks in itself as God, or rather it has the power to do what God can do, which is what the enemy Satan is trying to do today. So that theme where there's a rebellion and trying to be like God has been happening throughout history. Anyone else like to share? Next slide. All right, so our next question. Oh, by the way, here's another verse to add to it. Um, 1 Corinthians 14, verse 33. For God is not the author of confusion, but of peace, as in all the churches of the saints. Amen? So God is not the author of confusion. So. Let's go to our sixth question. After this question, be prepared to ask one or two questions that you guys have. So let's start with the sixth question. How can I be sure that I, I will really belong to the sealed people of God? How can I be sure? I'm going to give this over to Mike, and he will explain. Okay. Yes, this is a very, very great question, and I thank you, ladies, or for answering, um, asking this question. So when we look at the, the word sealed, you know, this seal is actually a beautiful thing, you know. God wants us to seal us in these end times. He wants to protect us from the time of trouble and from the seven last plagues. But how can we, the, as the question says, how can I be sure that I will really belong to the sealed people of God? In a nutshell, it's just to receive Christ. Amen. Next slide. Oh, next slide. As, as you can see that, um, you know, God's, God's love, you know, God's mercy, it, it extends to us for countless of ages. As we can see in the story of Moses, how long did Moses, I mean, no, I'm sorry, Noah. <laughs> how long did Noah preach, um, you know, to, to get into the ark? He, right, amen. See, you guys know. Anyway, so... You see that there, God used Noah to, you know, to call people to repentance, to call people to come back to him, to, to call him to, to call them to come into, into the ark, you know. So you can see God's, um, God's mercy in this. And you, you see another example as Jesus, you know, not only did he uh, walk on earth, not, did, not only did he come down as a baby and live the life, a sinless life to show us, the example on how to overcome sin and, and not only that, but he actually, what? He died on the cross for us. He died on the cross for us, but before that, he was calling everyone to what? To repent, yeah? So you see, over the years, he's been calling 
everyone to repent because he wants to seal us and he, want, he doesn't want us to, um, you know, to, to dwell in sin. And so, and, you, and, and if you look at it this way too, yeah, um, you know, like um, in, an, in another, in, so you might, you might think, oh, so how about the people who, who passed on before actually receiving the sealing? The, the passage that we have next is, is in James 4, 17. It says, therefore, to him who knows to do good and does not do it, to him it is a sin. Basically, God would only hold us accountable for what we know. Amen? So if we didn't receive the seal before passing on, you know, God is not going to hold us accountable for it. The seal is actually f for us in the end time. So when we go through um, the great tribulations or, you know, or the seven last plagues, it's going to be a protection over us. You know, it's, it's going to protect us. But in order to receive this seal, we have to receive Christ and we have to have him in our heart. Amen. Thank you so much, Mike. Um, I just wanted to also add um, just, some, just a little quote to, or some verses to add to this. Um, here's a quote from Spirit of Prophecy from the book Christian Experience. Uh, inspiration tells us, not all who profess to keep the Sabbath will be sealed. There are many, even among those who teach the truth to others who will not receive the seal of God in their foreheads. They had the light of truth. They knew the master's will. They understood every point of our faith, but they had not corresponding works. In other words, they had the faith, but faith without works is dead. They had the faith. They believed in Jesus. They knew prophecy. They knew the doctrines, but they did not apply it to their lives. That's why it's so important in Revelation chapter 1, verse 3. Blessed is he who reads who hears and who keeps this verse the, this this quote here is talking about those who heard and read but did not keep they did not have the corresponding works she goes on there these who were so familiar with prophecy and the treasures of divine wisdom should have acted their faith they should have commanded their households after them that by a well-ordered family, they might present to the world the influence of the truth upon the human heart. So it also starts in the home. It's not just knowing prophecy, knowing Daniel and Revelation, quoting scripture. Those are good stuff. But it's do they actually practice what they believe, practice what they preach, especially in the home as well, and present it to the world. Now here's some promises that will help us to give us that assurance it says in John, uh, 1 John 2, My little children, these things write I unto you, that ye sin not. And if any man sin, we have a what, everyone? An advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. And he is the propitiation for our sins, and not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. Can you say amen? Here's another verse, John 15, verse 3 to 4. You are already clean because of the word. Because, uh, which I have spoken to you. Abide in me and I in you, as the branch cannot bear fruit of itself. Unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless what? You abide in me. It's very important to abide in Jesus. Amen. Here's another verse, supporting verses. Blessed are they that do his commandments, that they may have the right to the tree of life and may enter in through the gates into the city. The Bible promises us, Jesus promises us that when we keep his commandments, that we have a right to the tree of life. The tree of life is in heaven. Amen? Here's a, a last one and then I'll open it up to the panel. Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you, I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go to prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there ye may be also. Is it, isn't that good news, everyone? 
Amen. God is thinking about you and I while he's in heaven. And he, he, the only thing on his mind is us. Amen. Anyone else would like to share? Yes. So you remember the Bible, it says, if you love me, keep my commandments, right? So when we love God, what will we do? Or when you love somebody, what would you do? You would, you would, um, you would, please, you would uh, want to please them. You would want to do things in order to keep them happy because of your love for them, right? So in the same sense, when we receive Christ, you know, we're going to want to do what he um, writes in his word or what he says through his word. Amen? So by loving him, you will, will be keeping his commandments. And by keeping his commandments, where is the seal, the seal found in, in the commandments, in, in particularly the fourth commandment? So when, we're, when we love God, we keep his commandments and we can receive the seal also. Amen? Because, you know, we may think, how about the other people who doesn't um, keep the commandments and stuff like that, you know? But when we love him, you know, God is so merc merciful as he did with Noah and as he did, as he did with, um, as Jesus did with the people when he was walking on earth and what he's doing for us today is that he's, you know, impressing our hearts. He's calling that, uh, he's making the cry to, you know, to come back to him, to repent, to come back to him and receive him fully. And when we do so, we'll be receiving his um, seal. So let's not give up on our uh, family and friends who may not be keeping the commandments right now. But what we can do, we can be the ones who can in, um, you know, introduce it to them, um, plant the seeds, and have the Holy Spirit impress, up, impress upon their heart as, you know, as they grow in their Christian walk. Like for me, I didn't grow up a Seventh-day Adventist. I actually grew up a Jehovah Witness and part Catholic because my mom and my dad. But then when I received Christ, I got baptized in a... Um, and another church other than um, a Seventh-day Adventist church. But as I, my spiritual walk grew with him and I was digging into the word, I noticed that, you know, it said that, if you love me, keep my, command, keep my commandments. So I'm, you know, as I, lo I look, like, what is the commandments? And then, you know, you find it in none other than Exodus. So as you grow in, in your spiritual walk, you know, you have more knowledge and you get closer to, to, to God. So my point is, is to be patient with our family and friends and, you know, just uh, we can introduce it to them and we can, you know, walk alongside them and allow the Holy Spirit to plan and, you know, move upon their heart to receive this, uh, you know, this seal. Amen. Okay, so now we'll open it up to the, to the floor. Um, I hope you guys have a question that you'd like to ask us. This is, we just finished the sixth question. So is there any hands? Is there any question out there? So if I hear it correctly, the question is, 
how come in Jesus' time, he came and people failed to recognize him? Would, it, would the sim a similar thing happen with us? Is that the question? Okay. Do um, you guys have anything? Um, in, uh, let's see. Okay, we're, I'm looking through. <laughs> um, okay, John chapter 1, verse 11. John chapter 1, verse 11. The Bible says, speaking of Jesus, he came to his own, and his own received him not. He came to his own, and his own received him not. Now, this is also connected to the 70 weeks prophecy in Daniel chapter, uh, Daniel chapter 9. In Daniel chapter 9, you have the 70 weeks prophecy, and in that prophecy, it is specific about Christ in 27 AD, when Jesus would be anointed or baptized, but more importantly, in 31 AD, when Jesus was going to be crucified. But in the 70 weeks prophecy, remember in the 70 weeks prophecy, 70 weeks was determined for the Jews, the, the Jews, the Jewish people. And the purpose of that, you can read it in Daniel chapter 9, was basically to get rid of sin, to stop sinning, to stop transgression, and to welcome their Savior into their hearts, to accept Jesus when Jesus would be anointed you know, as uh, here on earth when he was going to be baptized. But sadly, when he came to his own, according to John 1, his own received him not. Meaning to say, they rejected the prophecies of Daniel chapter 9, the 70 week prophecy, and as a result, they missed the boat with Jesus. Is this going to happen in the future? Yes. One day, because they have rejected the prophecies, because they have rejected God's word, they have rejected God's love, God's mercy, God's grace, one day when, they, when Jesus comes back again, they're going to be the ones to tell the mountains in Revelation chapter 6, fall on us and hide us from the face of Jesus. Hide us from his presence. And the reason why they're saying hide us from him is because they can't stand him they rather live in sin and in darkness rather, in, rather than in the light of Jesus. It also says in Isaiah 53 too that he's a man of sorrows. Specifically in verse um, two and three that he will be despised and rejected. Even, even now, he's still, of course, there's still time, but in short, the reason why the Jews rejected him was because they were, he was unimpressive. Basically, in short, they thought he would be a king to rescue him from the Romans. But to correlate in the last days, or in this time now, we have um, that time to be able to um, accept him. And also, the, the Jews of these days now, actually, many have rejected this chapter in chapter 53 of Isaiah. And when they read this chapter, actually they become, um, they understand and they see that, man, we missed the boat, but it's never too late for them. So basically in short, he, he is basically that man of sorrows. He'd be rejected by his own people. But at the end of the day, there's still a saving grace for them. Amen. Amen. I also want to share um, an addition to the rejection. I want to invite you to Daniel chapter 12, verse 4. And it says there, he's telling Daniel to, to keep his prophecy. So the things that which are revealed to him, God tells him to keep this. Or in other words, keep it safe. Make sure that it will last for a long time. Why? Because someday it says, many shall run to and fro. Many will be in search of this knowledge. Many will be looking for it. And it's saying that knowledge shall increase. However, knowledge doesn't necessarily mean wisdom. So it's one thing, like this message, we have been proclaiming it for a very long time. Um, for us Adventists, um, it began, um, one particular date could be 1844, 
and we've been proclaiming this message for a long time. But even if people hear this message, just like Mark shared a while ago and Liam as well, some people may reject it because they, might be, they may be blinded by the enemy. That they might be blinded by, um, remember Revelation says, he will speak great things and will confuse and will, will deceive many. So yes, there will come a time when people will, will fail to realize that the message is right in front of their eyes, but unfortunately, they will not be able to use that knowledge and turn it into wisdom. Amen. Amen. Thank you so much, for everyone, for sharing. Thank you for that question. Um, we will move on to our next question, and then at the end of the third question of this one, we'll jump into our next question, our panel discussion. All right, question number seven. What is the integrity of the SDA interpretation of Daniel and Revelation? Well, here's the answer. Even within the SDA church, there are many people who have wrong interpretations of Scripture. So just because you are a Seventh-day Adventist, it does not mean you have the correct interpretation of, script, of Scripture. Um, did you know that in our church, there are what we call offshoots in the Seventh-day Adventist church? There, have you guys ever heard of Branch Davidians? Have you heard of uh, Shepherd's Rod? Yes. So basically, even though this goes to, to show us that even though you may be an Adventist. Um, it doesn't mean that you, you have all the light and you, you know the correct interpretation because there are people even in the Adventist church uh, who have wrong interpretation and then sometimes they even get disfellowshipped or they even leave the church as well and they form another church. And so that's just the, the plain answer. Here's a verse. In Matthew 7, verse 21, the Bible says, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, whoever calls Lord, Lord is a Christian. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father in heaven. And notice what Isaiah 8, 20, this is a, a test. To the law and to the testimony, if they do not speak according to this word, it is because there is what? No light in them. And in Daniel chapter 12, verse 10, this is very relevant to us today. It says, many shall be purified, made white, and refined, but the wicked shall do wickedly, and none of the wicked shall understand, but the wise shall understand. Amen? The wise shall understand. Was Daniel wise? Yes. Was Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego wise? Yes. Daniel especially understood prophecy. And God's people in the last days will understand prophecy as well, spe specifically the book of Revelation. In John 7, verse 17, if anyone wills to do his will, he shall know concerning the, the doctrine, whether it is from God or whether I speak on my own authority. And last verse, he who is of God hears God's words. You probably have heard this phrase on Aeolus. 
when you log into your AOLS, you'll probably hear this verse. He who is of God hears God's words. <laughs> Therefore, you do not hear because you are not of God. Amen? Yes. Amen. Um, oh, here's an, a, another supporting verse. My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. Amen? God will have a people that understand prophecy, that are wise, and that will have understanding about Daniel and Revelation. All right. So here is a, a quote. Um, I'll just read this quote really quick. It says, in a special sense, Seventh-day Adventists have been set in the world as watchmen and light bearers. To them has been entrusted the last warning for a perishing world. On them is shining wonderful light from the wor word of God. They are to allow nothing else to absorb their attention. All right. Is there anyone else on the panel would like to share? Okay. All right. Let's move on to our next question. Question number eight. Is it possible that even if I belong to the SDA church, I am blaspheming God? Is it possible, even though being called an Adventist, to be blaspheming God? Well, we need to understand something here. What does the word blasphemy mean? In Scripture, the Bible tells us to blaspheme God means to claim to be God, number two, to claim to forgive sins, and number three, to speak irreverently against the Holy Spirit. Now, is it possible that you could be a seven-day Adventist and, and perhaps claim to be God? Yes? Is it possible to claim to forgive sins? And then is it possible to speak irreverently against the Holy Spirit? Well, the answer here is definitely yes. It is possible to belong to the SDA church and yet still be lost. Our religion cannot save us. Only our relationship with Jesus through faith in Him can save us. Can you say amen? Amen. A supporting verse. Of course, we read this one earlier. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father in heaven. All right. Our next two questions. Oh, yes. We'll go back. Renz has an additional. Well, um, just a very quick addition. When... The, one of the ways we can blaspheme God is when we claim to be God. God is our creator. He is our savior. He, and the Bible tells us that he is the instructor of our lives. So actually, the moment that we start to decide things on ourselves without um, counseling or asking for God's guidance, in a sense, we are actually claiming to be our own personal God because we are deciding things and we are following our own feelings, our own thoughts. Um, so, so the moment that we stop allowing God to take care of our lives, we are actually, in a sense, blaspheming by claiming that we are our own God. Just very quickly, um, so, you know, when it says that, you know, uh, blaspheming is basically uh, one, of the, one of the lines is to forgive sin. You know, like if somebody do wrong to you, of course you would want to forgive them. But most of all, that forgiveness of sin is what, it, is what God can do for them and not us, right? So if somebody do wrong to us, we can just basically forgive them for their wrongdoings. And we're not, we, we won't be blaspheming. So just, we, I just wanted to... Uh, make that clear because we might say, oh, I don't want to forgive them. I might be blasphemy, you know. But in, in all actuality, it's just basically it's, it's uh, forgiving them and they making right with God. Amen. Thank you, guys. Um, our next question, number nine and ten. Who will finish the end time gospel message? Is it the SDA church? Number ten. How should we preach the Adventist gospel, especially during this pandemic time? Good question. So the answer is God's remnant church, his saints, the 144,000, will finish the work according to scripture. But what we need to understand is who are God's remnant church? Who is his saints and who are the 144,000? Notice Matthew 24, 14. And this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world for a witness unto all nations, then shall the end come. Um, 
just a short nugget about our Seventh-day Adventist church and uh, the other churches as well. Did you know that uh, of all the religions of the world, um, there are two who top the list in preaching the gospel into all the world? Do you guys know what those top two are? It's actually the Roman Catholic Church and the Seventh-day Adventist Church. Did you guys know that? Do you see the great controversy between God's church and Satan's church? They're trying to preach the gospel in all the world to either save the world or deceive the world. That's an interesting uh, fact. In Revelation 14, verse 6, the context here is the 144,000. The 144,000 preached the three angels' messages. And notice what it says. Then I saw another angel flying in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel to preach to those who dwell on the earth, to every nation, tribe, tongue, and people. And of course it says, and saying with a loud voice, fear God, give glory to him, for the hour of his judgment is come. Um, God's remnant people will be preaching not just a message of hope, not just the gospel, not just the everlasting gospel, but they will be preaching a message about God's judgment. Now, of course, the judgment is not all doom and gloom. It's actually good news because what we learn in Daniel chapter 9 and Daniel chapter 8 and 7, judgment was in favor of who, everyone? The saints. That's God's people. And they, uh, the 144,000 are preaching this good news message into all the world that good news is for his people. Amen? And we don't have the time to cover the three angels' message, but in that three angels' message, you have Babylon has fallen. Come out of her, my people, as well. Um, I want to share with you a quote, Daughters of God, page 19. It says, It is our hope that church members around the world will gain new insights and blessings from reading this volume. God needs the talents of all his people to help finish his work on the earth. Amen? All right, anyone else would like to add? Yes? It's not just us, the SDA Church, but God has many sheep of many fold. And it says in John 10, verse 16, and other sheep I have which are not of this fold, them also I must bring, and they will hear my voice, and there will be one flock and one shepherd. So it's not just the SDA Church, but God has poured out his spirit unto all of the, the not denomination, but all of his followers. And so there are many followers or many sheep of different fold. And God has promised that he will call them out to be one, one flock and to be united under one shepherd. So I just wanted to reassure you. Amen. Thank you guys for sharing. Um, we're going to move on to question number 11. It's a big question. Are we on the right way if we disregard the government mandate for physical distancing and gathering this pandemic if we come join together in worship? Kind of like what we're doing tonight. Okay, so how do we answer this question? Well, let's look at the answer here. God is the one who actually created government. Did you guys know that? And it is our responsibility to obey the laws of government unless the government mandates a law that goes against God's law. In this case, we ought to obey God rather than men. Amen? We ought to obey God rather than men. So um, Romans 13 verse 1, just supporting verses. Uh, Let every soul be subject to the governing authorities. For there is no authority except from God and the authorities that exist are appointed by God himself. God is the one who, who actually invented government. And then um, Ephesians 6 verse 5 says, Bond servants, be obedient to those who are your masters according to the flesh with fear and trembling in sincerity of heart as to Christ. Um, and then also, but Peter and the other apostles answered and said, we ought to obey God rather than men. Amen? Amen. Anyone else like to add? Yes. So basically, like when, when we read this, according to the scriptures that we read, you know, as long as we don't go against God's law, as long as we don't go against God's will, it's okay to, um, you know, 
I guess, obey, not guess, but obey by the rules or, you know, go, go along with what the government or, you know, even our school is presenting as long as they, they're not, um, the rules that they're creating is not making us go against God. You know, sometimes God even ha puts us in certain places in order for us to preach the gospel, you know, as you see in Acts where Paul and Silas, they were arrested, you know, they basically, they could have argued, they could have done what they did in order to get out, but what happened? They actually, um, you know, there there was a great earth, earthquake, and what happened? Um, the, the the chains released, and even the guard he was basically he was um, shivering because he thought he was gonna be killed for allowing or not watching, um, you know, the prisoners as they, they they fled. But what happened? Paul and Silas stayed there. You know, they submitted to authority. They knew not to do nothing wrong or to do anything crazy. But what happened? They end up preaching the gospel to the to the um the uh, the, the guard and they and he received him and his household household received Christ so God is going to place us in in certain places and as you know let's not you know make you know like um like a tug of war if our the authorities or you know like the government or the schools is telling us to do something as long as they don't t make us or tell us to do something that is going against God's word, then we can, you know, it's good to submit in a sense to them, yeah? So let us be encouraged and just know that wherever God places us, he, um, he can use us, you know? I, you know, I remember in my, in my job back at home, you know, I was the, one of the two Seventh-day Adventists in, um, in, my, in my job at, at my workplace. My uh, boss wanted me to work on, on a Saturday but I, I told myself, if I work, my friend next to me, who's, a, who's a, another, fe uh, another fellow Seventh-day Adventist, he would be able, he would um, be asked to work on the Sabbath. But since I stood my grounds, you know, he respected me. You know, I, I told him, I'll do what I have to do. I'll work hard throughout the whole week. And, you know, just allow me to take the Sabbath off, you know, as what God would want me to do is, is to rest on the Sabbath. So... He, you know, he, he was okay with that, and he didn't ask my buddy, who was another seven-day Adventist, and we both enjoyed the Sabbath. Amen. Thank you guys for sharing. Our next question, number 12. What kind of SDAs will give the loud cry? Here's the answer. God's remnant church, his saints, his 144,000 will give the loud cry. Notice what inspiration tells us. The remnant people of God must be a converted people. The presentation of this message is to result in the conversion and sanctification of souls. We are to feel the power of the Spirit of God in this movement. This is a wonderful, definite message. It means everything to the receiver, and it is to be proclaimed with a loud cry. We must have a true abiding faith that this message will go forth with increasing importance till the close of time. It is God's remnant people that will be preaching this message. Amen? 13. What do we have to do to get God's seal? I'll give this to Mike. So this question is basically like the question that we um, <clears throat> answered and that was asked earlier but what do we have to do to get God's seal basically receive him and when we receive him what do we do like what I mentioned before we'll keep his commandments we'll um, you know follow his ways that he would want us to do you know the beautiful thing about the commandments is actually the commandments when you really look at it is actually God's character if you look at it it's God's character or, or, or God's spirit to to love your to love your neighbors and to love him. You know, the first four is to love him. The, the last six, the bottom six, is to love your neighbors. But when we love God and when we keep his commandments, we ac we're actually receiving his character and we're receiving the seal at the same time because the seal is what found in the fourth commandment. So that's basically, in, in a nutshell, it's basically, um, you know, receiving his word, keeping his commandments, and allowing, you know, his character and his law to change your life. Amen. Um, to add to this, 
um, the seal of God is found in the Ten Commandments, in which the fourth commandment contains all three of the ingredients, name, title, and territory. To have this seal means to keep his Ten Commandments, and specifically the fourth commandment. This means those who have the seal are Sabbath keepers. Also, God's seal contains the name of God. Names in Scripture represent character. God's love will be in His people, and by beholding Him, we become changed into His image. Amen? Amen. So we're going to skip a few. You guys wanted to? No, we no more time. Yeah. Um, did you want to do the seal of God mark of the beast? Okay. All right, so we're moving on. We're going to go to our next question. Number 14, what are the seven plagues of the last days? What are the seven last plagues in the last days? Well, the seven last plagues are for those who have the mark of the beast and those who worship his image. You can look Revelation 16, verse 2. Another name for the seven last plagues are the great tribulation, the time